did you take this apart? Well, how else was I supposed to get to the starter? Oh, Drake. What? Just because you put the key. That's where you put the key. I know these things. Volkswagen ain't made like that, Drake. Uh oh. Or any other car in that matter. Well, that's what you. Well, that's what you get when you go with German engineering. Yeah. Why do I still keep you? <laughs> All right. I don't know. I'll be right back, okay? Um. Don't. Don't touch nothing, all right? Fine by me. Fine by Gosh. me. I'll just enjoy myself a little Swiss roll here. Oh, yeah. Mmm. That's some good Swiss engineering right there. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, boy! Oh, man, that looks man, so good. Man, I've been drinking Red Bull and Green Tea all day, boy. I tell you what I am. Pump! Pump, I'm telling Woo! you. Hey, that looks like yeah, a... Yeah. Uh, Man, it's hot out there. I know you're the mechanic, but this might run a little bit better if you had an engine in it. Yeah, what's your what's your thought process on windows? What are you boys you yelling talking? about? Why are you coming all up in my grill yelling at me? Well, what, boy, let me what's tell you going what, on? Man, we're just happy to be alive. Yeah, you know, it's like that song says, the, Born to be wild. Get your motor running. Yeah. Okay. Head out on the highway. Can you for attention? That one goes all the way. Go, darling, make it happen. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Can you go? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Stephen Wolf. All right. Can you please go be born to be wild somewhere else? I'm trying to enjoy my Swiss roll in peace and quiet. Oh, okay. Well, I'm Swiss sorry roll. there, fella. I didn't know that we was in a public library. Okay, all right, all right. Now, just, just, what, is there something I can help you boys with? Well, yes. Yeah. We brought you our car. It's not working so well. Now, we just part, we didn't It's not all that's not working so well. No, no, what, no, no we're pretty what, sure what it's all the car that's that? not working. Never mind, that never mind. Okay, just just right. tell me what, what's going on with your what with your car. All right, well, General Schwarzkopf out General there. General who? Schwarzkopf. What? Are we're you? not too fond of General Lee. You know, from the Dukes of Hazard. Oh, boy. And yeah, General okay. General Schwarzkopf, that boy got stuff done. Yeah. Like right that moment, well, he'll play around. Uh, Operation Day. So, yeah, I got it. All right, so General Schwarzkopf, your car is not working. So what's, what's, what's General... What's the general up to? What's he doing? Well, whenever we're driving it, it keeps veering off to the right. Okay. And that's, to the left. That's an alignment problem. Yeah. Okay. Anything and else? And the back tires are uh, starting to back run. Yeah, thin. that'll do that. We uh -huh. can't seem to get the gas gauge to stop reading empty. <laughs> Got a family of possums that won't get out of the back of the trunk either. There's no gas pedal. Blinka won't stop blinking. The brake pedal <laughs> sticks. Is there? <laughs> Is there anything on General that works? Well, you bet your bottom dollar there is. Believe it or not, the radio comes in clear as day. All the oh, bells well. and whistles on that thing. 105.1, the mix. Thank you for that plug. Right, well, this day I still don't know what they're mixing. I don't know what they're mixing either, but I like it. So, you won't believe it. There's, oh. there's an old charger outside that. that yeah, thing, like, buddy, there he is. That's our charger. Guys, it, it, it looks like it's been driven through a meat grinder, though. Oh, 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 oh. That is General Schwarzkopf to yeah. you. Oh, Joe, thank you very I, much. Let me introduce to you. He gets stuff done. Let me, <laughs> may I? Right by himself. Let me All day. Let me, every day. All day. Let me day. introduce All to day. you. right now. <laughs> let me introduce to you Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Now, there he goes. You yeah. Emphasis on again. the dumb. No, Stop. we're both in Duke. Stop insulting the we're customer. Not tweedledee. Well, I'm sorry. Dumb and Dumber's asking no. for it. Hey. Hey, well, it's okay. I'm just sorry. Ignore him, fellas. Ignore him, okay? Yeah. I'm Joe. That's me. Hey, okay, nice guys. Uh, I'm a little oh, afraid goodness. to ask this, but how in the world did you get your car like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of got me, actually. I don't, I don't, I'm not real sure. Yeah, okay. man. You know, just, we're just a couple of good old boys, you know. Really. Don't mean no harm. <laughs> okay, really? stop right there. Let me. Let me guess. Tell, tell my Beats story. all you ever saw. That's right. Been in trouble with the law since uh -huh. the day you were born. How do you know what I was going to say? Yeah, it's a Dukes oh. of that. It's a Dukes of Hazard theme oh, 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 song. Well, it was loosely based oh, on our lives oh, in the first place. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you, you, you guys really don't drive like the Duke boys, do you? <laughs> oh, my. By the looks of General Schwarzkopf, it looks like they do. Let me tell no. you something. 
Obo over here. Uh, yeah. He drives like the Dukes, but kind of like mixed with like Vin Diesel and Fast and Furious. No. It's really. kind of like a mixture of those two going on. Yeah. Now, as to where Duke over here, boy, I'll tell you what, you get in behind the steering wheel. Oh that boy's Lord. like Optimus Prime from Transformers and Leonardo DiCaprio from the Titanic. <laughs> Only on non rainy days, though. That's a whole other story. How in the world did you? Get, You're joking, I don't really right? No. Yeah, I, I hope you. <laughs> I hope they're joking. You got. You guys do realize that cars ain't made to handle that kind of abuse. T TV isn't a reality, okay? Yes, you guys can't drive like that. Ever heard of reality TV? Well, Duke boys do it all the time. Yeah, Every they episode. do it all the time. Wow. But These they have stunt friends? drivers. Well, what do we look like? Look at this. Not show stunt drivers. Show right there. You, you know do not touch from? it. You don't look like stunt drivers. Two hundred push-ups. And by the way, down. they have a wow. thousand pounds of sand in the trunk, so they don't do it. Well, he told us about the family of raccoons that broke into our tailgate. It's not. That's at least sixty pounds. It's That's not heavy That's enough. A big and by the way, did you know they went through 300 general leaves through the whole life of that program? You are a liar. No. Two or three per episode. Look he, it up. Three, he's three, okay. guys. He's right. What are My you goodness. What are they seen. doing? What are you adding little up? Little squiggly. Little Dude, squiggly. I, I'm trying to think Do you squiggly. actually know how many episodes Dukes no. of Hazard had? Yeah, that's 300. No, oh, guys. My Lord. Lord. Guys, He's how many? Hillbilly math. How many generals do you guys have? Oh, uh, well, hold on, hold on. Well, I can tell I think him. We only got, we the, only one. got the one. The one. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, He's tough, though. Look it. Cars ain't made to handle that kind of abuse, okay? If you guys insist on driving like these uh, these TV shows, then you guys are going to destroy your car. Plain and simple. Man. Well, tell them. Can you fix them? Well, we'll see enough. what we can do. I'll tell you. I don't know. Switch. It's going to take a couple months, guys. We can get it done, but it's going to take... What are... I'm taking this. We're going to hold on to this all right. just to make sure that we got some collateral. We'll take care of it, guys, all right? Well, all right. Don't, don't worry. I'll get it all worked out for you. Take the Swiss roll. Okay. okay. Man, Uncle Jess is going to kill us. Wow. Well, you can't drive your car or live your life the way they do on the Dukes of Hazard, Wouldn't you agree? You're going to end up getting into a lot of trouble. We're in a series called Alignment, and here's the definition of alignment. is positioning for proper performance or the process of adjusting parts so that they're in proper relative position. Now, you, are, you know, may not know a whole lot about vehicles, but you do understand about alignment, especially if your car is pulling to one side or the other, or if it's shaking, or if your steering wheel's not straight or whatever, uh, tires are wearing out twice as fast. Same thing is true in our lives, that if we're not in proper spiritual alignment, which is what we're talking about, of course, then you'll find out that there's lots of shaking going on in your life, and you get steered off in directions you have no business being in, and you end up wearing yourself out twice as fast. That's why I want to talk to you about the power that's made available to us as believers, and that power comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, God's best for your life, wouldn't you agree, starts at the cross. It starts at salvation. Amen? You go there and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your, you know, your salvation of God's best begins at the cross. But it's sustained through the power of the Spirit. I'll say it again. You're saved at the cross. It starts at the cross. But you're sustained through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Spirit that Jesus said, it's better that I leave and I'll send the Spirit to you who will be a comforter, who will be a guide, be a source of power uh, for you. So it's possible to be saved at the cross, but yet at the same time stuck in a mundane rut in your life. And we want to talk about how you get out of that and learn how to live in and by the power of the Holy Spirit so you can live this a life of victory and, and, and peace. But there's a lot of things that try to get us to veer off the path in this life that are trying to pull us to one side or the other. I told you last week that in my talk with a mechanic a couple of weeks ago, I said, sir, I said, you know, what, what causes our cars to get out of alignment? And he said, you know, preacher, it could be as simple as, you know, hit, rubbing up against the curb at the drive through or hitting a pothole going down the road. And the same is true with us that, you know, we may be saved and born again and have God's spirit inside of us, but we still live in this world, right? We still got to drive down the roads, of life, we're gonna rub up against some curbs. We're gonna hit some potholes along the way, and from time to time, we're gonna need to pull into the shop 
and kind of get a, a realignment of source so we can work at our peak performance. I ended last week's message with uh, that scripture in Galatians chapter 5. I put it in your notes again, and that kind of highlights what a peak performance Christian life looks like, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, those type things. And it says, it goes on to say that we should you know, live by the Spirit and by the Spirit's leading. Now, there's another term that I want to talk about today, and that term is uh, walking in the Spirit. And it's a biblical phrase, a biblical term that really is about lifestyle. I put this in your notes, but it actually means to conduct oneself in a particular manner or pursue a particular course of life. And the Bible talks a lot about walking. Look at these other verses here. Ephesians 4.17 says, You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And just in case that's confusing to you about Gentiles and Jews and things like that, let me read it to you, the same verse out of the message, paraphrase, but it helps make sense. Paul wrote, and so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. Now, I don't know about your mama, but that sounds like my mama. My mama was the one that said, you know, now, Jeff, if they, everybody's jumping off a bridge, are you going to jump off the bridge too, right? Mama's always saying, be careful, don't follow the crowd, they're mindless, you're going to end up getting yourself into trouble, you know. So here's another walk scripture, Ephesians chapter 5 Verse 15 out of the King James here, I like the word it used. It said, see then that you walk circumspectly. That's a big word, doesn't immediately make sense, but circle, it's a good word. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now the word circumspectly means accurately, precisely, or exactly. So what it's saying is that we as Christians need to learn how to, doesn't come natural, doesn't come, you know, it's not just easy. You have to learn or train yourself how to walk accurately, precisely, or exactly. But according to what? I mean, we need a center line to align ourselves to. You know, a few, about a year and a half ago or so, my truck was out of alignment. It was pulling, there's no doubt about it. The steering wheel was shaking and it was pulling to the right and and uh, I guess I kind of gotten used to it. I was just overcompensating in my steering and just kind of just dealt with it. I was too lazy, didn't want to take it to the shop all day and pay the money and all that. But one day I ended up having a flat tire for whatever reason. So I took it to the tire shop and just got four new tires on it. And as I left the tire shop, my four brand new expensive tires, I was driving away and I was like, man. My truck's not vibrating anymore. It's not pulling to the right. Man, this is awesome. See, boom. I didn't need an alignment. I just needed new tires. Now, some of you will roll your eyes at me because you know better, right? And about six weeks later, it started vibrating again. It started pulling to the right, and I started wearing the tread off of those brand new tires, too. So I realized, hey, what I'd really done is I had fixed an external uh, thing on my car instead of actually fixing the part of the car that I couldn't see. I think you see where I'm going with this. We can put on a lot of external things in our life. We can fix up the outside of our life, put new rubber on our tires, and put 20-inch spinner rims on our car if we want to. But the truth is we've got to take it to a professional mechanic and have them fix the parts of the vehicle that we can't actually see. And the same thing's true in our life. We can dress ourselves up, but we've got to take our life, our you know, to the mechanic and have him fix and work on parts that aren't external. And that's really what you and I consider to be the heart, you know, having our hearts worked on with the Lord. But that even can be a little subjective. What does he mean when he says heart? What does it mean have your heart worked on and so on and so forth? You know, that can be just a little bit confusing at times. So what I want to do is I want to help you by breaking down the anatomy of our being, who we are. If you're going to talk about aligning parts, you got to understand the different parts. That's why you got that cool little graph there on the back of your notes there. Help you understand some things. Now, we'll start with this. Uh, God is a three-part being. I didn't put all this in your notes. We've taught on it plenty of times. And, you know, the Trinity, the, 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 the triune nature of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Now, we also, as human beings, are made up of three parts. Our body, our soul, and our spirit. And that's what that diagram there is in your notes. And 
It's got lots of stuff there with it. But 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this. Now, may the God of peace make you holy in every way. Look, look at the uh, different parts here. And may your whole spirit and body and soul be kept blameless. Hebrews 4.12 talks about how sharp and piercing the word of God is. It's able to rightly divide soul from spirit. It says, joints and marrow and the innermost thoughts and desires. Okay, now in this diagram there, there's a whole lot going on, a lot of things you can chew on as you process all this over the next coming weeks. But what I'm really trying to do is help you understand some of the things that are going on inside of you. Okay, we've all experienced days where it seems like everything's great, our marriage is awesome, kids are doing fine, job's happy, we're having a good day. You know, things are, you know, fulfillment, joy. But how many of you have also had days where, you know, you're depressed, you're down, uh, you're even experiencing some doubt or some conflict in your life? And I want you to understand what's going on internally inside of you so that you can learn how to speak God's word directly to those sources. It's very important. We did that today in our proclamation and prayer for the teachers. We're speaking God's word to the right places. How many of you know, we're going to talk about this next week, but you know, there's a kind of prayer that you pray where you're just kind of whining and complaining to God. Right? You ever prayed like that before and you realize this really is not doing too much. But there's also prayers you can pray that are very accurate, very specific, biblically based, that are confessing scripture, and you can actually sense the difference. There's a reason. There's a reason for that. So I'm trying to get you to understand uh, these, these, these points here. Look at your diagram there. The bottom part of that circle, the, the bottom third, is a part that we all understand pretty easily without a whole lot of explanation. And that's the body. It's the physical part of our being, okay? And it's very connected to and it's conscious of the world around it. That means that it's constantly uh, relating to and interacting with our environment through our physical senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Now, wouldn't you agree that by default, our body is speaking to us all the time? It's, all, it's sending us signals all the time. Ouch, that hurt. Or, oh, I like that. I'd like more of that. Oh, ooh, that stinks. Get away from it. Oh, yuck, gross. No more of that. Or yum. I'll take a plate full. Whatever. So our senses and our body is constantly speaking to us and sending us signals. Now, also, when we walk up to a mirror, the first thing we see is our body. I mean, we don't want to walk up to a mirror and immediately see our spirit or our soul. And the same thing with other people. It's the first thing you see of someone else, and it's the first thing they see of you. Now, one of the flaws of our humanity is that really because of that, we judge a lot of people based on their outer appearance. Wouldn't you agree? How they're dressed, what they're wearing, what they're driving, what, where they live, um, how they fix their hair. And if you're like me, you can learn over time that you can't really tell what a person's made of until you get to know them on a deeper level, something deeper than just uh, skin deep or just the body. But that's where things start to get a little confusing, and that's where we'll spend our time, okay, is the area of soul and spirit. Most people assume that soul and spirit, or a lot of people make the mistake of assuming that soul and spirit are interchangeable, that they're kind of one and the same or um, that they're synonymous with one another, but in fact, they are separate parts of our being. Look at the top left part of the circle there, that third, and you'll see the soul. That's the mental, kind of the mental part of who we are. Our body is the physiological side of us, and our soul, though, is a little bit more of the psychological side of us. It's the mental part of who we are. It's the part where we experience self-awareness. This is interesting. It's also the part of who we are that, that we relate to other people from this area. We're not relating to people necessarily with our body. We're relating to them with our, the soulish side of who we are. And that's because the soul is really made up of three different things. Because again, if I say soul, everybody has a different definition of that. You might not understand what that means. So let me break that down. Our soul's made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. Now those aren't bad things, but wouldn't you agree that those three things are our thoughts, our will, our personality, and our emotions are very powerful things. I mean, they're very, very powerful things. In fact, 
just so we can, you know, get all the semantics right in our conversation here, when we use the term soul, we're talking about heart, mind, I mean, uh, you know, our, our will and our emotions and our mind, we're really talking about our heart, okay? Now, here's what I mean by that. Whenever you say to your wife or somebody that you really love or to your kid, you're saying, I love you with all my heart. What you're really saying is, I love you with my mind, I love you with my will, my want to, and I also love you with my emotions. I mean, that, that, would, be, that would be real love, right? And that's the soulish side of who you are, our heart side. Now, we start talking about heart. Hope you're following me. You start talking about heart, there's some real things you've got to start uncovering in Scripture because the Bible says a whole lot about heart, about guarding it, about protecting it, about being led by it, about being sanctified, all those things we'll get into in this series. But let's just face it, okay? If you could picture a volcano, all right, with bubbling cauldron of explosions and lava and, and, and a lot of volatility on the inside of a volcano, that's really what the soulish side of our being is like. Our heart, our soul is very volatile. It's very explosive uh, place. Look at Jeremiah eleven eight. I'll prove this to you. It says, they didn't listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubbornness of their own evil hearts. Listen to this, Jeremiah 9, 17, 9. This one's real strong. It says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. And desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Now, we've all said the phrase, and we're not saying it maliciously or vindictively, but we've all made the, made the statement, you know what, honey, just follow your heart. You know, just, just do what your heart tells you to do. Now, we need to understand, <laughs> that's not a bad statement, okay? But it can get us into a lot of trouble, right? Because what we're really saying is, do what you think feels right in your mind, in your will, in your own emotions. So we're really pushing people to make decisions based on their soulish side, how they feel about things, the things their body's telling them. But wouldn't you agree that we need to start learning how to be led by the Spirit and filled up, baptized in, dominated by the Spirit, not our body and not our soul, our mind, will, and emotions? You see where I'm going with this, right? But I'm still building here, okay? So you just follow your heart. Just remember, we're talking about our mind, our will, and emotions. And I don't know about you, man, but before I got saved and gave my life to Christ, and even many times after that, I've dealt with the fact that my heart, if I let it, can get me into a mess. I mean, my heart can get me into a lot of trouble because it, 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 it leads you down wild emotional roller coasters, crazy emotions, outlandish reactions, and one I love the most in premarital counseling is unrealistic expectations. Because our heart has all these idealistic TV shows of what our life's supposed to be like, what our marriage is supposed to be like, what our children's supposed to be like, so on and so forth. And our heart can be very deceived that way. And that, for me, led me to ultimately having a broken heart. Now, I can tell you this. Having a broken heart or having your life crushed or being at the bottom of a barrel is not always the worst thing because many times that's where you meet Jesus, right in the middle of brokenness. You never are going to become a born-again Christian in the state of pride, amen? amen. You're going to come to him broken. So in my state of brokenness is where I came to the Lord. Now listen to me. And I ask Jesus to save my soul, didn't I? I said, Lord, please, Lord, come and take my heart, my soul. Lord, I give you my mind, my will, and my emotions because, hey, they're all over the place, Lord. I need to be saved. I need to be redeemed. Amen? So when I finally got to that place, I was able to, maybe you can relate, I was able to admit, hey, my heart can be very misleading. It, it really, I can't trust my heart. I listed these briefly in your notes three reasons why you can't trust your heart, okay? One is, and you know, this is, I'm speaking for myself, but it's foolish. My heart's just foolish. Again, the world says follow your heart. You know, Jeff, do what you think's right, but the problem is, is I may just do what I feel, feel is right at the moment, whether I, where it's actually right or not. You know, you've heard the term love is blind. It's true, isn't it? Sometimes you just can't even see the truth. You've also heard this one. Well, the heart wants what the heart wants. It sure does disregarding consequence or hurting anybody 
or whatever, the heart's like a steamroller, man, and it's completely foolish at times. Proverbs 28, 26 says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. So our heart can be terribly foolish. The second thing is our heart can be unreliable. Wouldn't you agree that feelings and emotions are shallow and fickle and unreliable? I mean, they change like with every circumstance that happens to us. The truth is, what we feel is right in the middle of the emotional moment. You ever been in trouble because of this? All of a sudden ends up being like the sourest, sourest, worst mistake you've ever made in your life. But in the heat of the moment of the emotion, it all felt right. Now, what happens is we take that kind of selfish way of living where we just feels good, do it, and you do what you feel and follow your heart and all that kind of stuff. And really, honestly, not to try to hurt anybody's feelings, but that's really what is fueled countless broken homes and divorces. Because I can't tell you how many times somebody's come and said, well, you know, uh, five years has gone by and I just feel differently. Or, I, you know, I just, I feel like I've fallen out of love with this thing. Listen, our heart is unreliable. It's foolish. And the third thing is it can be quite corrupt. Matthew 15, 19 says, from the heart, listen to this, from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, slander. That sounds pretty corrupt to me, wouldn't you agree? So don't follow your heart and your heart alone. Don't blindly follow. It's foolish, it's unreliable, it's corrupt, okay? But back to it. We're talking about our heart, our soul. We're primarily dealing with our mind, our will, and our emotions. The things we think about, our will is kind of our personality. Some people are very strong-willed, okay? They've got a strong drive towards success and achievements. Some are more passive or relational, uh, more reclusive. And then the emotional side of us is, you know, basically how we feel about things. Now, wouldn't you agree that these three things greatly affect the way we respond to things around us and how we relate to other people? Our mind, our will, and our emotions. And I'm going to begin to wrap up with this. Listen, that's why we need salvation, because we need to be born again. Listen to me. When you come to Jesus and you're saved by grace at the foot of the cross, God saves your soul. And then he puts his spirit in your body. Okay, so if you look at your diagram, God puts his spirit in your body, and then he saves and redeems, buys back your soul. That means he redeems your mind, he redeems your will, your want to, your drive, your passions, and he redeems your emotions. Can somebody say a good amen? And that's why people begin to see a change in you, because you begin to process things differently. Listen to this verse here in 1 Corinthians 6, last verse today. It says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you at the high price, so you must honor God with your body. Now, I, I'm out of time today, but next week, I want to finish the third part of this. I mean, I, I was going to try, attempt to do it today, which would have been a little foolish, because you would have been here for another 30 minutes. But next week, we're going to look at the spiritual side of us, the spirit side. We've got the body, we've got the soul, and now we're going to talk about the part of our being that is filled up with God, and it's from there that we communicate with God. It's from there that we worship, okay? It's from there that we pray, okay? You know, and we're going to learn more, more about that spiritual depth. Bottom line uh, you and I are going to learn in this series the simple, direct fact that you have a choice. You can walk in the flesh or you can walk in the spirit. But just like driving a car, I'm sure you learned, you've only got one of these lives. And you can wear it smooth out. I mean, there's probably story after story after story in this room of people who know what it's like to go down the wrong road. Of people who know what it's like to break a few axles in this life and uh, bang up and bruise their car you know, and have to take it to the mechanic and say, hey, God, sorry, I broke it. You ever had to do that before? Lord, I'm sorry, I broke it. And the amazing thing about us as believers is we serve the God who is the creator of all creation. He's the master at rebuilding broken lives. Amen? So you're in the right place at the right time. No matter your past 
All that matters from this point forward is your future. God can restore broken places. He can put together any vehicle or life and set it back on the right course. Can you say amen today? And that's why you're here, because you have hope. And you put your hope in the Lord, not in your soul. Not in your own mind, not in your will, not in your emotions. You're putting your hope in the Lord and say, Lord God, I need less of my flesh and I need more of your spirit. God, baptize me, submerge me, twist me around, flip and flop me around. I need your spirit in my life. Amen? I don't want to drive my life like the General Lee and the Dukes of Hazard. So what we're going to do in this series in closing is just commit to live according to and in line with God's word, God's will, and his plan for our lives. Amen? All right, let's pray. Well, Lord, I thank you for just kind of helping us open up this discussion about our body, our soul, and our spirit.